I've been investigating HARP for a number of years now, yet have been reluctant to put out a definitive video on the subject. HARP stands for High Altitude Active Auroral Research Project. The aurora they are researching is caused by the warping of solar radiation around the magnetic field of Earth, what is commonly called the ionosphere and magnetosphere. And how exactly the Earth's magnetic field warps this massive flow of solar wind around the Earth. Now there are many theories out there on the internet surrounding HARP. Some suggest that it can be used to control weather events like Hurricane Katrina. Others say it can trigger earthquakes such as the magnitude 7.0 tremor that shook Haiti in 2010. So my first question is, how can resonant ionospheric heating have the kind of pinpoint accuracy that would be required to control massive atmospheric weather phenomena like hurricanes and geological events like earthquakes? Well, by heating the ionosphere above a storm system, you could seed the cloud with a small amount of energy. I say small here as a relative term since compared to the amount of energy inside a typical hurricane, these amounts are small. But in reality, facilities like HARP need to pump enormous amounts of energy into the ionosphere in order to provide the energy which is seeding that cloud, plus all the energy their equipment wastes in the process, plus all the energy that goes out everywhere all over the planet as this thing is running. So yeah, I'm not doubting that this could actually work to seed a hurricane. I'm just realizing that it would be very inefficient and perhaps impractical. As for triggering earthquakes, it also seems like a very difficult thing to do accurately. Sure, I know about simple harmonic oscillators and how they can be tuned to the resonant frequency of a structure to produce a standing wave, which then can be gradually increased in amplitude until it begins resonating violently. This is the same concept behind Tesla's so-called earthquake machine that was tested by Mythbusters and shown to actually work. I just don't see how heating the ionosphere miles off the Earth could produce mechanical waves on the ground that would be capable of triggering an earthquake. I also don't understand why the government would want to help create a natural disaster like Hurricane Katrina or the earthquake in Haiti when both of those ended up being PR disasters for the government. Don't get me wrong, I totally get things like the 9-11 conspiracy. I understand how Bush's Carlyle Group and Cheney's Halliburton and the Military Industrial Petroleum Banking Intelligence Complex benefited massively from 9-11 and the ushering in of the National Security and Surveillance State under the guise of the War on Terror. That stuff's pretty obvious if you do the research, how and why they needed 9-11 and who benefited and how they benefited. I just don't see HARP being used effectively for weather wars or as an earthquake machine. Besides which, the Russians have had their own HARP-like facility called Sura, which has been operating since 1981. HARP was built in 1993 and didn't even become fully functional until 2007-2008. So why didn't the Russians trigger any massive weather or earthquake attacks during the Cold War? Oh wait, some conspiracy theorists think that they actually caused those Midwestern floods in the 1980s. Okay, so how about the Chinese, who have the largest space weather research program on the planet, known as the Meridian Project? There's also the European Incoherent Scatter Scientific Association, ESCAT, which has a facility in northern Scandinavia, and the High Pass, High Power Auroral Simulation Observatory, an ionospheric heater located in Fairbanks, Alaska, that is operated by researchers from UCLA. These scientists are not bound under NDAs and have no known affiliations with black projects, special access programs, and do not possess any special security clearances. I am sure that if you email any of them with a genuine academic inquiry into these subjects like active auroral weather manipulation and the possibility of earthquake machines, that you will get a legitimate response. From a scientific perspective, we must always look at experiments and reproducibility. So scientifically, such claims of weather manipulation and the ability to cause earthquakes can only be proven with repeatable experiments which would, of course, require much more data to be collected on such large-scale events like a hurricane and an earthquake, and the corresponding ionospheric activity at the time to prove that those two events are, in fact, correlated. Um, so scientifically, we have a, a long way to go before we can definitively say, yeah, Harp's an earthquake or a weather machine, okay? However, there still lurks the question of why the military are so interested in Harp and why this shroud of secrecy and mystery surrounding it all. A lot of that may just be due to the way military security works, and if you explore the history of ionospheric research, particularly within the military, you'll find some perfectly legitimate explanations for why the military are so interested in HARP. You see, the ionosphere also works like a reflective mirror for long-range radio signals. In order to send signals long distances, like beyond the curvature of the Earth or over the horizon, you either have to send the signals through the ground, relay them through a satellite, or bounce them off the ionosphere. 
Some signals get stuck up in the ionosphere and just circle the Earth aimlessly for ages. You can actually go out today and stick an antenna up into the ionosphere and still pick up tiny snippets of signals that were broadcast back in World War II and whatnot that are still bouncing around up there. During the early days of OTH, or over-the-horizon radar communications, they noticed that solar storms and other atmospheric conditions would severely affect signal transmission, and much research was done into ways to improve signal transmission, as well as ways to disrupt enemy signals. In 1958 and 1962, the U.S. detonated several nukes in the ionosphere to assess the impact of high-altitude nuclear explosions on radio transmissions. Project Argus and Project Starfish had lasting effects on the Earth's magnetosphere and the Van Allen radiation belts. One witness said the entire sky turned to fire, and he thought that the world was about to end. The Russian woodpecker was a notorious Soviet radio signal that could be sporadically heard on shortwave radio bands worldwide between July 1976 and December 1989. The mysterious signal gave rise to theories such as Soviet mind control and weather control. So don't think that those ideas are new with HARP. They were around 20 years before HARP ever existed. From what I have learned about mind control, it has much more to do with beliefs, suggestion, persuasion, ideologies, and social conformity than anything else. And it's very difficult to transmit those types of things to humans via an electronic signal. It just doesn't work that way. For my own personal scientific research, I have come to question whether or not these rumors of mind control, storm seeding, and earthquake weapons were not just, in fact, cover stories being used to throw researchers off the trail of what HARP can really be used for. So I began exploring other possibilities, and what I found might surprise you. You see, the HARP technology and the idea of using what are today called Schumann resonances and tapping into the ionomagnetospheric resonance cavity were first theorized and developed by none other than Nikola Tesla himself and his Wardenclyffe Tower technology, which was subsequently shut down by J.P. Morgan once he found out the gist of what Tesla was really up to. Tesla knew an awful lot about waves, frequencies, and resonances. Tesla had discovered the Schumann resonance cavities long before Winfred Otto Schumann ever did. Tesla just never cared to name his discoveries after himself or publish his findings. What Tesla knew was that there is a massive stream of energy being emitted from the sun that is diverted around the Earth by the Earth's own magnetic fields, and that this massive flow of radiant energy represents an unlimited, ever-present, abundant, non-polluting, sustainable source of energy for the entire planet, available to anyone with the machinery to tap into it. We merely need to invent the paddle wheel that can tap into this massive flow of energy and harness it for conversion into unlimited, free electrical power for the entire planet. And Tesla was working on building just that before he was shut down. Wardenclyffe Tower was Tesla's great attempt at inventing this so-called paddle wheel. The project was also used to research wireless power transmission. Both of these ideas could not be metered and were thus of no interest to the bankers funding Tesla's research, and so the project was shut down as the now infamous history goes. But could Tesla have succeeded in actually tapping the Earth's ionosphere for power? Most of the scientists I've talked to tell me that it would be a very hard thing to do. HARP and other ionospheric research facilities have been carefully studying and documenting these active auroral resonances and how they can be affected through externally applied electromagnetic fields. Since the ionosphere is spherical in shape, the resonances which disrupt the ion flux are spherical resonances which have spherical harmonics, which set up interference patterns specific to the geometry of a sphere, and also specific to the location of the emitting device and the frequencies that it is emitting. As a result, HARP is useful for radar, communication, and geolocation purposes, all of which serve a military interest. Hence the present interest of the U.S. Air Force and DOD. Something Tesla understood was that these ionospheric resonances were related to all the lightning on the planet and that Earth's atmosphere was electrically active, similar to a giant capacitor that would build up electric charge until electrostatic discharges would occur as lightning in the atmosphere. Tesla also saw the massive power that lightning contained, and he viewed it as a potential power source that could provide limitless free energy to the entire planet. The energy of an average three-mile-long lightning strike is 1 billion to 10 billion joules, which is enough to light 116 100-watt light bulbs for one day. Evidence shows that lightning strikes hit Earth 100 times every second, which is over 8.5 million lightning strikes per day occurring on the planet. 
more than enough electrical power to serve all mankind's energy needs in the foreseeable future. Of course, that's all assuming you could figure out a way to directly convert that energy from the electrical potential energy stored in a thundercloud or inside the Earth's ionosphere and turn it into a stable, storable, usable supply of energy. So far, attempts at harnessing the energy directly from a lightning bolt have been unsuccessful. In the summer of 2007, a company called Alternative Energy Holdings Incorporated did some experiments to test a design plan for a lightning generator that the company had recently purchased from an Illinois inventor named Steve Leroy, who reportedly powered a small 60-watt light bulb for 20 minutes off of the energy harvested from an arc in a laboratory. Leroy's lightning harvester concept was essentially an array of towers with, with grounding wires to shunt most of the discharge and a capacitor to store a small portion of the energy from the bolt. But according to the CEO of the company who bought and tested the technology, they just couldn't make it work. It quickly became apparent that this was not the best approach to the problem. Some have looked into building better capacitors, which would be more suited with the capabilities to absorb the energy of a lightning strike. Research into new anode materials, such as spinel anodes, have shown some promising leads, and material scientists are discovering new dielectric and semiconductor materials every day. But there are other researchers and inventors who think that these people are all wasting their time to reverse engineer the lightning bolt. They think that by the time the arc of the lightning bolt happens, it's already too late. They think that the real power source is up there in the clouds themselves, rather than on the ground. These critics argue that the electrical potential energy stored up in the clouds is much more attainable and usable than trying to harness the kinetic energy within a lightning bolt itself. They compare a lightning bolt to a high-speed bullet train. While inventors like Steve Leroy try to engineer what essentially amounts to a crash pad, which can effectively absorb the entire impact of the colliding train, these other researchers are instead thinking outside the box to imagine riding on the train itself trying to imagine ways to tap into the clouds themselves and harvest the energy directly from the atmosphere. But this approach has some problems of its own. It's extremely difficult to build towers that are three miles tall or taller, and no one seems to have any better idea of how else you could plug a lead wire directly into the upper atmosphere or ionosphere to complete such a circuit. But what if we didn't need wires or circuits at all in order to tap into this massive energy source? At least Tesla didn't think that wires would be necessary. In fact, he had envisioned an entire worldwide wireless power transmission system and was experimenting with ways to actually make it work up until his project was shut down. What do you think the world would be like today if he had succeeded? While I don't have all the answers just yet on how to build such a hypothetical paddle wheel and or a Wardenclyffe Tower reverse engineer that technology, and most of Tesla's notes and ideas are now lost to history, it's a problem that I'm thinking about and working on constantly. I definitely believe that this is one potential source of free energy that is real and will work if the right people can put their scientific problem-solving minds toward a solution. Perhaps someone can figure out a way to sap wireless electrical energy from thunderclouds and other atmospheric weather systems. Perhaps a whistleblower from HARP will come forward with some information on how to use active auroral research to pull electricity from the ionosphere or magnetosphere. Perhaps a backyard inventor will figure it all out on his or her own and then release it to the world overnight. Who knows? I've recently updated the HARP page on my website, alienscientist.com, so please check the links in the description and visit that page for more information. As new ideas and information come into view regarding this subject, I will be updating that page, so please check back from time to time as research progresses. If you have any information you think should be brought to my attention, please send it to me. Don't forget to check out alienscientist.com on Facebook and like my page there as well. Thanks for watching. It's time to occupy Tesla.